Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Avalon Bristow, Program Director for MARCO and Co-Coordinator for MACAN. Today, we're very excited to have five fellows who recently completed their Mid-Atlantic Sea Grant OA Fellowship Program share the highlights of their research. But before we get to that, wanted to give you all a quick look at our upcoming webinars. In April, we will introduce several studies from open ocean and nearshore habitats where chemical observations are being combined with biological monitoring to improve our understanding of ocean acidification impacts to organisms and the ecosystem. We will be sending out a registration link for that shortly. And the next webinar after that to be held in May will highlight a diversity of career paths for students keen to study ocean and coastal acidification. With that, I would like to invite Pete Rao, Executive Director of New Jersey Sea Grant, to introduce the fellowship program and our presenters today. Uh, each of our speakers will have 12 minutes to present. Following the presentation, we'll have about 15 minutes for any questions and comments. All participants will be muted, so please ask your questions via the question box. Please also feel free to submit your questions at any time. A reminder that this webinar is being recorded and will be available on the MACAN website on the resources page with our previous webinar series. Without further ado, uh, here's Pete Rao. Pete? Okay, thank you, Avalon. Hi, uh, if you don't know me, I'm Peter Rao. I'm the Executive Director of the New Jersey Sea Grant Consortium. And it's hard to believe that it's uh, been, I think sometime since late 2016, uh, that uh, the NOAA Ocean Acidification Program and the National Sea Grant Office uh, started discussions with the Mid-Atlantic Sea Grant uh, programs uh, to create a uh, uh, opportunity for fellowships uh, within the Mid-Atlantic Sea Grant region from uh, New York to uh, North Carolina. I think focused all the way down to uh, Virginia on this one to be more in line with uh, the NOAA uh, uh, regions. And so, uh, you know, RFPs going out uh, in 17 and, and the, uh, I guess, the process uh, to find six fellows uh, uh, to do their uh, graduate research on ocean acidification. And it, it all started in August, uh, 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 a mentoring or training week uh, in August. I am just excited that uh, uh, we're able to do this uh, with the uh, NOAA Ocean Acidification Program. They provided a, a, a large share of the funds for that, for us to do this, and that we competed uh, for this, I do want to uh, applaud uh, the fellows uh, that uh, have been participating in MACAN uh, meetings or other presentations. Uh, uh, some of those uh, 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 quick presentations at the various meetings, uh, and obviously other national meetings. Uh, so they've been quite active and in support uh, of ocean civilization and for MACAN, in particular, particularly uh, Anthony Himes. Uh, who's been assisting uh, with the MACAN meetings, you know, uh, throughout. Uh, so um, I'm tickled. And so now we're at a point where I think everyone is uh, completed and and on to other things. And and maybe they'll each will let you know. But uh, I do, uh, you know, want to uh, congratulate and thanks, uh, you know, Teresa and Caroline and uh, and uh, uh, Faye, Doc Faye, uh, uh, Anthony. And Liza, uh, for uh, for being uh, excellent uh, uh, researchers uh, and for ocean acidification, and and just a, a plug, I did see uh, Liza's uh, uh, dissertation defense, outstanding. And so I'm sure we'll hear some more of that here. I do want to recognize uh, the sixth fellow that was not here today is Amanda Zahorik, who was at Delaware and supported uh, by Delaware Sea Grant. And just to uh, uh, let everyone know that. Uh, her projects on ocean acidification and microbially uh, mediated shell calcification in the eastern oyster, oyster crest ostrea virginica. And, and, and as another uh, uh, part of that, uh, she also presented with most everyone here that's presenting today. Uh, I guess that was in 2020, I think it was right before, but that was with the, uh, uh, the Virginia Sea Grants uh, graduate student, uh, 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 fellowship or, or symposium, graduate student symposium, and excellent talks there as well. So I am just very pleased with the excellent research and the excellent uh, 
young professionals that are with us today and uh, look forward to hearing uh, the talk. So I uh, appreciate very much and look forward to future partnerships with everyone. Thank you. I wouldn't, I don't know if I was supposed to do the introductions or if that was, uh, uh, or to, uh, to start the talks um, or not. Uh, Avalon, did we have a, were you doing the inter individual introductions? I sure can, thank okay. you. Yeah, okay. uh, we can go ahead and turn it over to Teresa Schwemmer right now. Teresa, looking forward to your presentation. Thanks okay. so much. Thank you. And thank you, Pete, for uh, introducing us uh, with the background on this fellowship. Um, okay, so I have to show my screen. Um, can, can people see my, uh, like, I can't tell what you're seeing. Is it we my... can see your internet browser, so you might want to change it. Okay. To your presentation. I have two monitors, so it didn't give me the option. Uh, okay. I think I have it figured out now. <laughs> Thank you. Uh-huh. All right, uh, thank you again for the introduction and uh, to the organizers for inviting us here today. Um, sorry, still trying to get this to show up right. Okay. It's still, um, it looks like it needs to be in presentation mode. If you wanted to try and, yep, there you go. Perfect. All set. All right. Um, so my project for this fellowship and uh, for part of my dissertation work has been modeling the energy budget of Atlantic Silver Sides using experimental data from several multi-stressor experiments with different CO2 temperature and oxygen treatments on Atlantic Silver Sides. And uh, my main, it's been a lot of projects that I'm going to try and uh, go over in a short amount of time, but my main co-authors for the energy budget work are my committee member, Roger Nisbet from UC Santa Barbara, and my advisor, Janet Nye, who is now at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, so we know that environmental conditions are changing in the oceans and in estuaries, and several of these conditions, such as acidity and oxygen, tend to change concurrently. So we, acidity is gradually increasing over time, but it also has some dramatic fluctuations in the bays and the estuaries uh, due to things like eutrophication. Um, and we see coastal acidification in addition to global warming and expanding hypoxic zones. Um, these physical conditions can influence each other, but they also have interactive effects on marine life such as fish. We've seen a lot of studies looking at the effects of one or more of these stressors on individual organisms, looking at things like growth and survival. Uh, but now there's a growing need to take these organism level effects. And uh, a lot of people are trying to make population and ecosystem level predictions uh, because these are often the most relevant or useful for things like conservation and management. So to try and bridge that gap for my project, I've been working on using experimental data in a dynamic energy budget model. Um, so I work on Atlantic silver sides or Manidia Manidia, which is, sorry, a small uh, but really abundant fish in estuaries. And I've done a lot of experimental work looking at for the physiological mechanisms of how high CO2 combined with temperature and hypoxia affect silver sides. A couple of common themes have emerged that led me to want to model the energy budget and uh, like I said, try to expand beyond just looking at the internal physiology of the individual organism and look at more like the whole life cycle and things that might affect um, population traits. Uh, so a couple of the themes that I've seen throughout my experiments uh, include that silver sides are pretty tolerant of acidification by itself, but when you add another stressor, it can cause an interacting effect. 
Um, we've seen that sensitivity varies between life stages and in particularly between the embryo and larvae stage. There seems to be a big difference in sensitivity there. And uh, overall, the physiological mechanisms that we've uncovered are really interesting and important. And um, I've become a lot more interested in trying to incorporate them in as much detail as possible in the model. So one response I've looked at is routine metabolic rate. And by measuring oxygen consumption uh, with a microrespirometer, um, so we have these microrespirometry plates that we use where you can have an individual embryo or larva in each well. And here you can see there's one larva, you can see his little eyes uh, poking out at the top and here's another one. Um, and then there's a black sensor spot at the bottom of each well. So we can get their individual um, oxygen consumption rates and calculate their metabolic rate from that. Uh, and we found that CO2 and hypoxia um, from the treatments that we took these fish from, they had an interacting effect where high CO2 makes the metabolism more oxygen dependent. So the blue line here is the ambient CO2 and uh, the red line is the highest CO2 level that we used. And um, we have oxygen on the x-axis. So the metabolic rate became more oxygen dependent um, as you increased CO2 level. Um, so I developed a conceptual model of these interactions based on the established shape of a routine metabolism curve plotted against oxygen. Um, and we think that high CO2 both increases the metabolism when oxygen is abundant. So orange here is the elevated CO2 level and blue is ambient. Um, but then we also think that high CO2 increases the threshold or peak rate at which metabolism becomes oxygen dependent. Um, and so the black dots here are the oxygen levels that we used. We only used three levels because these were like our experimental tanks. Um, so we only captured really a segment of this relationship that uh, we kind of conceptualized. But um, it seemed really important for understanding how energy is allocated differently and um, how they use aerobic metabolism or potentially switch to anaerobic metabolism under acidification. So in order to get a better picture of this relationship for the energy budget, I was able to use some of my fellowship funds to do another set of experiments where I reared silver sides in ambient and elevated CO2 levels. And this time I measured oxygen consumption for each embryo or larva as it went from fully oxygenated all the way down to zero um, so that we had like every oxygen level in that range. And I'm still working on analyzing this, but it'll help give us a fuller picture of this interaction and uh, eventually be used in the energy budget as well. Uh, so another example of the importance of interacting stressors and different life stages was when we looked at the ionocytes. Um, these are the cells that transport ions in and out of the body for acid-base balance. So we we're interested in seeing, um, for example, do they have more of these cells when uh, CO2 levels are high and pH is low? And uh, this is an embryo from one of our experiments. And the ionocytes are these dark purple cells um, which I stained with immunohistochemistry. Uh, and these cells use energy to transport ions against their gradient and uh, help the fish respond to changes in pH. So this is a potential mechanism by which more energy could be expended under high CO2. So this is the ionocyte density of, on the skin of embryos on the left and one day post-hatching larvae on the right. In both stages, we saw interactions between temperature and CO2, um, but the temperature effect is reversed after hatching. So here, temperature is, uh, ionocyte density is decreasing with temperature, but once they hatch, it starts to increase with temperature. And in both cases, the effect is intensified at the highest CO2 level, which is this darkest shade of blue. Uh, and sorry about all the switching colors <laughs> um, between the different figures. Um, 
So after seeing the importance of life stage for CO2 effects, I, want to use a, I wanted to use a modeling approach that accounts for the different energetic demands and inputs between each life stage. So for example, embryos aren't eating um, and juveniles aren't yet putting energy into reproduction. So if we have different effects at different life stages, I wanted to be able to account for the different types of effects on the energy budget that that could have. Um, and this is also a common uh, method or type of modeling used when you want to bridge the gap between organisms and populations. So dynamic energy budget modeling is set up so that you have the energy assimilated from food uh, being channeled into a somatic and reproductive branch uh, with somatic on the left here and reproductive on the right. And it, it's split up the, uh, at a fixed ratio called kappa. Um, on, each, and e on each side, um, the energy is going toward both structure and maintenance, uh, with maintenance basically being homeo maintaining homeostasis. Um, and so once you estimate the parameters of the model, they can be used in population models, and there's a variety of established uh, like software packages, for example, that let you do that, such as an individual-based model. Uh, so I've been working with a package called DevTool to estimate parameters based on the data that we have for silver sides. And I hypothesized that somatic maintenance costs would increase under high CO2, leaving less energy for growth. Um, and that would also help explain the reduced growth that we've observed in some previous experiments. I also hypothesize that the proportion of energy that goes to the somatic branch of the energy budget or the kappa fraction would increase, leaving less energy for reproduction. And the data that we can include in the model uh, includes life history information, such as the age and size at each stage transition, um, the length and weight throughout their life, the reproductive rate, and the oxygen consumption. And I took some of this information uh, just from the literature on the like hundreds of experiments that people have done on silver sides throughout years and some of it came from our ocean acidification experiments so we have uh, data for both ambient and C elevated co2 levels and the outputs are parameter estimates that describe energy allocation and these can be used to quantify things like population growth traits uh, so far i've run the model with data from two different co2 treatments 400 and 2200 microatmospheres and we have data for this on length, weight, uh, wet weight up to 122 days post hatch, and weight at hatching, all of which we've uh, observed decreasing under high CO2. And I'm currently working on getting the code to work for including the uh, respirometry results as well, uh, just struggling with that a little. So that isn't included in the model results that I'm presenting today, but eventually it will. <laughs> um, so, these are the 12 parameters that I that were estimated for ambient CO2 versus high CO2. Um, but I'm just going to focus in on a couple. And I should also mention that I'm working currently on kind of narrowing down these parameters and trying like fixing some of them and seeing which parameters are actually most influential to the model fit uh, to try and avoid overfitting. Um, so one difference between CO2 treatments is that the fraction of energy that goes to the somatic branch or kappa decreased slightly from 99.9% .9 to 99.6%. Uh, it's a slight difference, uh, but it looks like more energy is going to reproduction under high CO2. Uh, somatic maintenance, or which is basically the cost of maintaining homeostasis, increased, which is what we predicted. Uh, so they're spent they're spending more energy on maintaining homeostasis under high CO2. And then the cost for structure decreased under high CO2, uh, which suggests, so the cost for structure is the amount of energy put into each cubic centimeter of body structure. And this suggests that they're somehow slightly more efficient at forming their body structure uh, and reproductive structures under high CO2, or at least putting less energy into it. Um, so, the hypothesis was supported um, for 
additional energy being spent on maintaining homeostasis, but the second hypothesis was contradicted in that they're allocating a slightly greater percentage of energy to reproductive costs rather than somatic. Uh, the population level implication of this is that they could be balancing some of the mortality that we've seen in experiments by increasing reproductive output uh, to potentially minimize losses in population growth. So in addition to adding the respiration data and the data from my more recent experiments, my next big step is to try and use a model that incorporates the hypoxia and the CO2 interaction that we saw um, mainly in the respiration results. And I'm working with my committee member, Roger Nisbet, on a model that can create a more detailed model fit for embryos based on the increased oxygen sensitivity under high CO2 by using a, uh, what's called a damage dynamics module. So we think that if they're not able to meet the energetic demands of high CO2 when oxygen is also low, they may be accumulating damage that has downstream effects on their energy budget. And further into the future, I'm starting, uh, as I am starting to uh, wrap up my PhD and look for postdocs, uh, I'm interested in the combined effects of pollutants with environmental stressors like acidification and hypoxia. Um, these are, like realistically in the wild, fish are experiencing all of these stressors at once and they're all, they all tend to be getting worse. Um, and so I'm interested in applying the experimental methods and the modeling methods that I've used um in the past to uh, uh this topic um so i want to thank my co-authors roger nisbet and janet nye and also the uh noaa ocean acidification program and sea grant for this amazing fellowship which has just been a great opportunity in so many ways and also nsf for funding some of the previous experiments and I want to thank the NILAB and just uh, a lot of other people that are too many to name right now uh, for all the help with the experiments and the modeling uh, and like feedback. Um, here's a quick little video of an embryo uh, heart beating. And you can kind of see the blood flowing there. And I'll be happy to answer any questions when we get to the question period. Or you can contact me over email or reach me on Twitter. Thank you. Now I'll hand it over to Caroline. Uh, Thank you so much, Teresa. And welcome, Caroline. I think Caroline's uh, camera is not working if I'm remembering correctly, but you will hear from her in just a few minutes. Yeah, so my camera is not working. Um, Can everyone see my presentation? I can, yeah, thank you. Okay, great, um, thank you. I'm Caroline Swanner and I work with Dr. Bassam Alam in the Marine Animal Disease Lab at Stony Brook University. And I'm very excited to share part of my project that was funded by the OA Graduate Research Fellowship. I'm going to be talking about using gene silencing to validate the role of a pollution gene in Crossostria virginica or the eastern oyster resilience to ocean acidification. We know that oysters are vulnerable to OA because it is more difficult to precipitate biogenic calcium carbonate under acidic conditions and their shells are composed of 95% calcium carbonate. I wanted to start by sharing results from previous research that inspired this project. These photos are of Mercenaria mercenaria, or the hard clam, that were reared in acidic conditions for one year. You can see that there was thinning of the shell as well as the development of holes in the shell. However, not all clams had damaged shells and some actually survived two plus years in acidic conditions. Um, this study was conducted on adult eastern oysters that were maintained in control or acidified conditions for six months. And at the end of the six month period, the shells were notched and regrowth was monitored over a period of 21 days. 100% of the oysters that were maintained in control conditions had at least partial shell regrowth. And the majority had completely regrown shells, as you can see in the photo. For oysters that um, were in the OA condition, 80% of the oysters didn't have any shell regrowth, only 20% regrew shells. 
But we can see that in both the clams and oysters exposed to OA, there was a subset that appeared to be more tolerant to acidic conditions. These animals are found in areas with variable pH and sometimes extreme acidification events. These figures all show long-term monitoring of pH on their, from data collected in Southampton, New York, Wellfleet, Massachusetts, and Flax Pond in Stony Brook. And you can see that variability in pH of these areas. The red line on each figure represents predicted future pH at the end of the century, and you can see that it frequently drops below this. Because oysters and clams already face acute exposure to low pH that is greater than predicted climate-driven changes, they must have some mechanisms that enable them to tolerate these conditions. Um, so we sought to investigate this. We investigated mechanisms of resilience to OA. Here, I will be focusing on our work looking into the molecular pathways underlying resilience to ocean acidification, but we did explore other mechanisms such as energy and feeding. Um, this research is actually from the first part of uh, the research from my OA fellowship. We reared oysters in control in acidified conditions and compared their SNP or single nucleotide polymorphism and gene expression profiles. You can see that survivors of ocean acidification had alleles that were significantly enriched compared to controls, as well as differential gene expression. So there was convergence of evidence from both of these approaches. Um, and we identified potential candidate genes that might be associated with resilience to ocean acidification. One of these genes was prolucin. In our study, prolucin contained a missed SNP, which means it causes a non-synonymous change. So it's a different amino acid, and this could cause um, potentially a difference in protein function. And this SNP was enriched in oysters that survived the acidified conditions compared to controls. Um, prolucin was also upregulated under OA stress in larvae and juvenile oysters. Um, and in other studies our lab did, we saw prolucin overexpressed as well. And further supporting prolucin as a potential candidate gene, it was upregulated in hard clams that were exposed to ocean acidification in different life stages and in different populations of hard clams. And lastly, prolucin was upregulated in the Manila clam, Sydney rock oyster, and Mexican goey duck all exposed to OA stress, so the broader literature supports this choice of a potential candidate gene. This makes sense because, as I mentioned before, ocean acidification makes it more difficult for calcifying marine organisms to precipitate biogenic calcium carbonate due to the alterations in carbonate chemistry of seawater that OA causes. And prolucin is a protein that is involved in the formation of nacre, where it is to promote the crystallization of calcium carbonate. It is important for the nucleation and shape of these crystals and bivalve shell formation. And it is also expressed during initial shell development when bivalves are particularly sensitive to ocean acidification. The top um, panel here shows calcium carbonate crystals under a normal condition. They appear to have this nice normal orientation and alignment. And then the bottom panel shows what crystals look like under acidic conditions, and they have structural disorientation and irregular alignment. Our objective was to utilize RNAi or RNA interference, commonly referred to as gene silencing, to inhibit the expression of prolucin so we could validate our findings and confirm the protective role of prolucin associated with resilience to OA. So we used gene silencing. Um, briefly, I'll explain how we did this. We created double-stranded RNA to target our gene of interest, and through a process called transfection, which I will go into detail later about, we introduced it into the cell. Once the dsRNA enters a cell, it is cleaved into small interfering RNA by a ribonucleus known as dicer. The small interfering RNAs are assembled with proteins into an RNA-induced silencing complex known as RISC, and the activated RISC binds to the complementary transcript and cleaves the mRNA, which leads to sequence-specific degradation of the RNA, mRNA resulting in gene silencing, and there is a feedback mechanism to ensure that this happens continuously. So here we had a dsRNA um, to silence our pollution gene, and throughout the presentation, shades of green are going to represent the gene silencing treatment. We also had a negative control that doesn't target any part of the oyster transcriptome so that we could see if the introduction of foreign RNA had any unintended consequences, such as induction of immune response, and the negative control will be represented in orange. Lastly, we had a control that was just seawater, so we didn't have any probes added, and this will be shades of blue. 
So as I mentioned before, we needed to introduce the dsRNA into the cell via a process referred to as transfection. Because we were not sure what would work, we had two different designs and kind of did a Hail Mary pass to just hope that one of these would work. For the first method, we strip spawned oysters and collected eggs and sperm in separate containers. The sperm were split into three groups. One received a dsRNA probe, one received the negative control, and one had nothing added. It was just seawater and sperm. And, and then the sperm were mixed and incubated with the eggs um, in, for fertilization. And the hope was that we could use the sperm to actually deliver these probes into the egg. For our second method, we induced spawning in the sea table, took out males and females, mixed their egg and sperm, and allowed them to develop to the trochophore stage, and then soaked them for 24 hours in a higher concentration of the probe or seawater. I first wanted to check if the process of transfection impacted viability, as they were held at a higher stocking density than normal during the transfection step. And as you can see, neither transfection method induced mortality. After the transfection step, we put our oysters in either normal or control seawater. Um, control had a pH of around 8 and acidified seawater had a pH of 7.3. Um, the method 1 larvae were transferred to their PCO2 treatments within four hours of fertilization, whereas method 2 larvae were transferred over 24 hours later. The darker shades are the control seawater and lighter shades are acidified seawater. Um, so we had our different PCO2 treatments, probe treatments, and then the two different um, transfection methods, and each one had a replica of three. Um, and you can see from the photo on the left, the setup took up the entire lab. The first thing we wanted to do was to check if prelucin was indeed overexpressed under our acidified oysters, because otherwise it would be a moot point. And yes, we did have overexpression of prelucin in acidified conditions compared to controls. The next step was to make sure that we successfully knocked out or silenced our gene of interest. And as you can see, both transfection methods were successful in significantly reducing the expression of our targeted prelucin gene. Lastly, we wanted to see if there were observ observable phenotypic changes between our silenced oysters in the OA and oysters in OA that would support the idea that prelucin helps mitigate the impacts of OA. Since prelucin is important for biomineralization, we wanted to quantify biomineralization and we used cross-polarized light mix cross-copy to do this. If calcium um, crystal, carbonate crystal formation was disrupted, it would make sense that shells developed abnormally or that larvae appeared deformed. So we checked shell formation to look for abnorm abnormalities. Um, we also looked at growth and we also looked at viability. Changes in biomineralization and shell development were evident um, from both transfection methods, and growth was significantly different in transfection method one, and there were no differences in viability in either methods from inhibiting prelucin expression. Um, so first I'm going to talk about biomineralization. The, the degree of calcium carbonate mineralization within the larva shell was evaluated by measuring the intensity of biofringes under cross-polarized light. So cross-polarized light passing through calcium carbonate is double refracted. So shells with a higher concentration of calcium carbonate would double refract more light. So there would be a higher intensity of biofringes. And you can use this as a proxy for evaluating biomineralization. So we took photos under cross-polarized light, and then we converted the images to grayscale. And I assigned a value to each larva um, using image J. So um, black was zero and like pure white is 255. And I called this my biomineralization index. This is a first time point looking at mineralization. For the controls, you can see negative control and seawater control are basically the same, but gene silencing control has less mineralization. For the acidified treatments, all OA ones were less mineralized than controls, and the negative control with OA um, in seawater had similar mineralization. However, gene silencing and OA was the least mineralized. This was mineralization for the next day, and it followed similar trends. Again, gene silencing under OA had the least mineralization and was significantly less than negative control in seawater. Um, there was also similar trends for day five, and um, same with gene silencing OA having least mineralization and being significantly lower than the other um, OA ones. <clears throat> 
However, day seven, we saw a little different trend. Um, the gene silencing OA was not significantly less mineralized anymore. It was actually higher than seawater, so it appears that the gene silencing effect um, might be over. And when we looked at our qPCR, we saw that prolucin was no longer um, knocked out at this day, which was, would explain this. Um, next, we investigated shell abnormalities, and I want to show some videos because it demonstrates how their behavior um, also kind of changed. This first one is gene silencing under OA, and you can see that there's a larva swimming around that looks healthy with a nice shaped shell, and then we have one that looks like its valve, um, it almost appear, appears crumpled, and it has some difficulty swimming. Uh, the next video is gene silencing under normal conditions, and you can see there's a lot of irregular shaped larva as opposed to the nice D-shaped larva, and they also had some differences in swimming. Um, so above is a nice normal D-shaped larvae, and below are examples of what I classified as the form larvae. Um, again, I kind of think that they have a crumpled appearance and they have irregular um, valves or weird shapes. And there were significantly greater number of deformed larvae in the OA plus gene silencing treatment. Lastly, we saw differences in size. However, it was only significantly different from larvae um, from the first method. Here's an, um, an extreme example of some of the deformities we saw. Most deformed larvae were smaller and the shell almost appeared to grow up and out and almost crumpled um, rather than what you see of the nice D-shaped larvae. Gene silencing was um, the smallest larvae and gene silencing plus OA was significantly smaller than larvae just under um, OA conditions. So both transfection methods were successful at significantly reducing the expression of prolucin. However, the transfection method did influence some of the results, specifically size. My hypothesis is that the method one had immediate exposure to OA conditions, whereas method two that had that longer transfection um, missed maybe a key development point. So it was not because of the method, it was because of their time of exposure to the PCO2 treatment. Both transfection methods had reduced biomineralization and greater deformities um, under OA conditions. So I do think that these results support the idea that this prolucin gene does help larvae mitigate the impacts of OA. Not only does this validate um, previous results we found, but it also is a functional analysis of the prolucin gene. Um, so now I just want to take a moment to thank everyone who helped, um, specifically members of my lab, um, and then John Dunn or Barley for providing the oysters for us and helping us with the spawn. And then I would also like to thank my funding sources, um, specifically this fellowship. Um, and with that, I will take questions at the end of the Q&A session. Thank you so much, Caroline. That was fantastic. Um, at this time, we'd like to welcome Faye Da. Welcome. Right. Uh, thank you. Can anyone, can everyone see my slides? Yeah, you may need to put it in presentation mode. Okay. Uh, is it looking good? It's still, um, we can, it's still like the base PowerPoint. Um, let me see, you might okay. just need to change the monitor that you're sharing. Um, see if I can. Okay, how about now? Yeah, there you go, that's perfect. Thank you. All right. Uh, hi everyone, thank you so much for tuning in today. Uh, my name is Feda, I'm a PhD student here at VIMS. Uh, today, I will talk about how extreme events can impact the carbonate system variability in the York River, which is in the uh, Chesapeake Bay. First, I want to acknowledge my uh, co-authors and the funding uh, agencies, specifically this fellowship funded by NOAA Ocean Education Program and Virginia Sea Grant. Uh, 
So in S-strings, there are multiple different drivers can impact the carbonate system, such as uh, exchange with atmosphere, uh, precipitation, river input, and net community production. All these different processes can impact the uh, carbonate CO2 system. And my first chapter focused on the how different drivers can impact the Dakedo trends of the Chesapeake Bay carbonate system. And it was published last year. Uh, here is the published on the GGR Ocean. Uh, please feel free to check it out. And today I will focus more on a, a shorter time scale and a smaller a spatial scale, uh, because in asteroids we have large spatial and temporal variability in the CO2 system, uh, means that the chaosifying organisms could uh, already living closer to their physiological limits, and uh, sudden changes associated with extreme events could push them uh, exceed the threshold, and causing some uh, detrimental consequences. And in Virginia, the oyster industry is very important to local economy. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we uh, choose our study site as the York River, which is a small sub estuary on the western side of the Chesapeake Bay, showed by the red racket rectangular. And the, the green diamonds you see are commercial and uh, uh, academic hatcheries in this region, and they are primarily on the uh, closer to the shoreline and in very shallow regions. So previous observational studies uh, looking at the pH data collected in the lower York River, which is indicated by the uh, red star here, you can see uh, there's large variability in the in pH. And the pH change within one month can be higher than the 30-year uh, change observed in the Chesapeake Bay. So this is in 2018. In 2018, we uh, also had record high precipitation, and that caused the die off of oysters in the Chesapeake Bay. There are some uh, news cover uh, news. There are some uh, news about this uh, die off events in the Chesapeake Bay associated with uh, this high uh, river discharge. The figure in the center here compares the river discharge in the York River uh, between 2017, a normal flow year, and 2018, a much wetter year. Uh, so in the red line, you can see we have much higher uh, river discharge in 2018, especially this high, this huge peak uh, spike in the summer and later in the fall have more consistent uh, but smaller high discharge events. So we ask two questions. What are the primary processes controlling the uh, carbonate system throughout the York River? And what are the impacts of extreme events on the carbonate system? The method uh, we use is a three-dimensional ecosystem model. Uh, the figure on the left here shows the model domain, uh, including this York River. And for York River, we have two tributaries, like a, like a fork here. And for the main body of the York River, uh, we have like from the head of the York River all the way to the mouth, which is connected to the main stem of the lower Chesapeake Bay. Our model has 120 meter horizontal resolution and 20 vertical layers. We simulate carbon nitrogen cycling, including the CO2 system. Uh, additionally, we, in, we included carbon and nitrogen fluxes from wetlands as a boundary condition. Uh, so those are indicated by the green color in the figure on the left here. So we provide the model with different forcing from atmosphere, airstream boundary, and river input can simulate the CO2 system. So as I said, first question is to understand the controls on the CO2 system. So what we did first was to calculate the uh, budget of DIC and alkalinity. We ran the model for the year 2017 and calculated the annual mean budget uh, for the entire York River, including tributaries and the main body of the York River. Uh, we, let's first look at DIC budget. There are four terms. If the error is pointed into the box, means it's a source of DIC, and if leaving the uh, box means it's a sink of DIC. So as we can see here, uh, we have river input of DIC and down, a little bit of downstream export, a lot of air uh, outgassing of CO2 and net community production uh, is a source of DIC because overall uh, the York River estuary is a uh, net heterotrophic. Uh, overall, the three terms here are is, uh, on a similar magnitude for advection term, we usually combine the river input and downstream export and call that net advection. So that's the difference between these two blue arrows. And all these uh, uh, all these drivers are on sim uh, similar magnitude. Uh, 
If we look at our clinity budget, uh, similarly have river input downstream, downstream export, we also have uh, nitrification impact on alkalinity and NCP impact on alkalinity in the model. Overall, alkalinity budget is more conservative compared to DIC. Uh, what I mean by that is the river input roughly equals to downstream export. So what's how much coming in basically equals to what uh, how much goes out. So overall, alkalinity is more conservative. With all these controls on DIC and alkalinity, we could also try to calculate the controls on other CO2 system variables such as pH, omega, hydrogen ion. Uh, first, we take this uh, DIC and the alkalinity budget and combine the advection terms into one, uh, call that net advection term. So for each uh, variable, DIC and alkalinity, we have three controls. By combining the change in temperature and salinity, we can estimate uh, how each, how, we can estimate the uh, change in pH due to all different controls uh, such as NCP, advection, and etc. And for today, I will only focus on the first three controls on pH uh, because these three are the most, impor most important ones. Uh, the next, in the next couple of figures, I will uh, show the daily rate of change in pH due to all these different controls. As I said before, we ran the model for the year 2017, which is a normal flow year. What I'm plotting here is a time series of the daily rate of change in pH due to uh, net community production, uh, bio, uh, which is bio biological processes. Uh, on the y direction, you can see that's the distance from the head of the estuary. So zero means head, and above zero, that's tributary, and below zero, that's the main body of the York River, all the way to the mouth, which is connected to the uh, lower Chesapeake Bay. Uh, so first, I want to point out the like during the summer months, uh, this uh, daily rate of change in pH due to biology is positive. That means the system is net autotrophic, uh, so can net consume DIC and contributing to increase in pH on a daily basis. And in tributaries and uh, in in the tributaries throughout the year, it's always like auto, uh, net heterotrophic, so that's decreased pH on a daily basis. Another important control on pH is the net advection term. Uh, for net horizontal advection, we can see most, uh, the, the color is primarily blue, means that overall this advection term decreases pH on a daily basis. That's because uh, we have net advection of high DIC water from the upstream. Uh, I don't remember if, uh, so in previous slide, I showed the alkalinity and DIC budget. So overall in the York River, we have more uh, DIC coming in from the river uh, than those come than alkalinity into the York River estuary. So we have more DIC. That's why the net advection of high DIC water is contributing to this decrease in pH. Finally, we can look at air CCU flux. Uh, so the system is primarily uh, outgassing of CO2. So you can see that's why the uh, the air CCU impact on pH is positive. So because we have outgassing and especially in the tributaries and upper portion of the estuary. Uh, so another question we are interested in, in in this project is how extreme events can impact on these controls. Uh, I will zoom into this two months period from mid-June to early September and look at what if we have a, uh, extreme, an extreme event. The first three uh, panels uh, you see here are exactly what I showed in previous slide, but just zoomed into the two months period from mid-June to September, uh, similar uh, Y axis, the distance away from the head of the asteroid. Uh, so, for my, so that is the reference round. For the sensitivity simulation, we ran a model for two months period showed by the gray shading region, and we transplant a one extreme event from summer 2018. Uh, so in that so for this extreme event we changed the temperature we changed river input, atmospheric forcing and boundary condition. So all these change all these things are changed for the two weeks period when we have this uh, extreme event. Uh, one example of the forcing the change in forcing is the figure here. Uh, you can see uh, during the ex extreme event we have much higher uh, river discharge compared to the reference run, which is the blue line. So then we can look at how this extreme event can impact each the controls on pH. Uh, so the, before the dashed line, 
this period means that we have that extreme event. And after that line, every model forcing just returned to the reference condition, same as this, uh, the first row here. So before the, uh, during the extreme event, we can see the system throughout the York River, it becomes more net heterotrophic. This means because we have more uh, sediment influx and also organic matter coming in that causes more respiration. So the, the entire York River asteroid becomes heterotrophic and decreased pH uh, through this biological proce pro process. And after this high discharge event, uh, we can see that the system switched back to net autotrophic condition. However, uh, especially in the upper part of the asteroid, uh, looks like there's some delay and this net autotrophic condition becomes weaker and also delayed by like uh, uh, a week. Overall, the, this extreme event, uh, the impact of this extreme event on bio biology uh, lasts for about one month. And after one month, the system returned to climatological condition if we compare to the reference run. Uh, the second term is uh, net advection impact on pH. So during this extreme event, we have more uh, high DIC upstream water coming into the system. So that's causing additional decrease in pH. And similar to the bio, 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 biology, uh, the physical impact lasts also about one month period. Finally, we can look at the how air CO2 exchange, uh, how, how this air C flux can impact the pH. So during high discharge, uh, high, extreme event with high uh, discharge and high sediment and organic matter input, we could have more outgassing and the outgassing region extended all the way to like lower, middle, lower parts of the asteroid. So in summary, uh, net advection, air CO2 flux and NCP, they all play crucial roles in controlling DIC and L uh, pH, but alkalinity is more conservative compared to DIC. And during the extreme event, the pH reductions are associated with uh, net heterotrophic condition and the advection of high DIC water from upstream, uh, with the outgassing playing a small counteracting role. So this study uh, could provide some critical information for local shellfish uh, industry. For example, it took about like one month to, for this system to get back to uh, normal or climatological condition after this extreme event. But that also depends on how strong the uh, event is. Um, so yeah, so that's all about the summary. And if you have any questions, please uh, answer that during the Q&A session. And uh, please, please feel free to contact me if you have uh, further comments on questions on this study. Uh, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much, Faye. Okay. Now All we'd right. like to, to welcome Anthony Hines. Okay. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Hi, Anthony. Thank you. And we will be um, taking questions at the, at the end of today. Thank you. Can you see my slides, Avalon? I can, I can see uh, your PowerPoint. Um, you might need to put it in presentation mode. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, oops. So today, um, well, first off, my name is Anthony Himes. I'm a PhD student at the Virginia Institute of Marine Sciences. Um, and today I'm going to talk about my project that looked at if the influence of water quality history on adult oysters can have any impact on future ocean acidification tolerance in larval eastern oysters within Chesapeake Bay. Um, so for some background information on oysters just generally, they're a really important ecological species. Um, they provide a lot of important ecosystem services such as water filtration, which helps improve water quality. They can also draw down excess nutrient loads, um, potentially from runoff. Um, and as a reef forming species, they also provide um, habitat for um, other organisms. But beyond just their ecological importance, they're also uh, very economically important. 
um, as they're a foundation for um, a fishery and an aquaculture industry up and down the East Coast, um, not just within Virginia. And that aquaculture industry in particular is continuing to grow and expand. Um, so it's, it's really of concern what's going to happen with the Eastern oyster um, as climate change continues. And as a calcifying species, one of those big concerns is um, ongoing ocean acidification. Um, so this figure here on the left is from the newest IPCC report. Um, and as you can see, there's a series of different uh, projections here of different scenarios based on how much human intervention there is in combating climate change. But in all of them, we will still see um, decreases in pH from where we are today, which is about at this break point here. Um, and we're going to see decreases in the open ocean. Um, but particularly, coastal systems are a lot uh, more vulnerable to ocean acidification as they naturally have lower buffering capacities and they have um, typically more primary production, um, which can lead to more bacterial respiration, which is another source of CO2 into the water column that can further exacerbate acidification. So if we look at Chesapeake Bay specifically, uh, this is a simulation that takes into account high levels of respiration within a system. And what we see here, um, particularly looking at salinities between 10 and 20 here on the x-axis, is that's um, where the oyster populations I'm gonna talk about in a second are from. We can see as um, if respiration's increasing as ongoing eutrophication is happening along with continued acidification from um, atmospheric CO2, we can see really severe drops um, in pH as the current summer average pH um, for the reefs that I assessed uh, is about 7.8. So we're already a lot lower than the open ocean. And then with um, further respiration due to eutrophication and with continued ongoing um, acidification, we could have really severe drops potentially down into the 7.2, 7.1 range. Um, which is really concerning for organisms that uh, produce calcium carbonate shells like oysters. Um, another aspect of this project is that I wanted to assess differences between populations. Uh, there's previous work done in other species that has shown um, populations within a species range can be very different physiologically to one another. But unfortunately, there's really not a lot of work that's been done specifically within marine invertebrates looking at how different populations can be within a species range. So that's something we really want to focus on. And it's really important to understand those differences because it could have real um, strong effects on how we estimate the impacts of climate change on a particular species. If there's a lot of variability there, depending on which population you assess to make projections on how a species will tolerate future climate change, you could either be overestimating or underestimating what the true impacts will be. So it's really important to do these population level assessments and really understand in a specific environment what's going to happen with these ecologically and economically important species. Um, so overall for this project, our kind of governing hypothesis was that the water quality history experienced by adult oysters at a particular reef over generations would have an influence on how well larvae spawned from those oysters can tolerate ocean acidification. Now, why were we thinking this? Um, so specifically, we were thinking in water quality history in terms of salinity and alkalinity, as those are important factors um, that govern ion regulation in the cell. Um, and there's a lot of overlap between osmoregulation from which would be necessary in lower salinity environments with acid-base regulation in response to ocean acidification. Um, so if you look at these figures here, um, the first one here on the left is a generalized model for osmoregulation within marine invertebrates. Um, and then the one on the right is acid-base regulation, um, kind of generalized for a cell within marine invertebrates again. And there's a lot going on in these figures, but the things I really wanna highlight here, there's two main enzymes that are involved in driving both osmoregulation and acid-base regulation. And those are carbonic anhydrase shown as CA in the figures, and also sodium potassium ATPase. So our thought here is that oyster reefs that experience lower salinity environments, such as in more northern regions of Chesapeake Bay, um, they may be more well adapted to dealing with that low salinity. And if that adaptation takes the form of more of um, improved enzymatic regulation through carbonic anhydrase and sodium potassium ATPase, that could translate 
to um, better tolerance to future acidification due to that overlap in these um, cellular regulatory mechanisms. So what we did um, on this map here, the yellow stars indicate our two different reefs. So our higher salinity reef was from Pages Rock Reef in the York River tributary, and our lower salinity reef was from Parrot's Rock Reef in the Rappahannock River. Um, so we collected oysters from those reefs. We allowed them to naturally ripen um, in their native waters before we then brought them into the lab and strip spawn them to produce larvae. Um, we then specifically targeted the first week of life of the larvae as that's when they're most susceptible to any sort of environmental stress. Um, and then we exposed them to a range of pH conditions. Um, now, unfortunately, due to COVID and some issues with having to overlap projects, we weren't able to expose both reefs to all four of these pH conditions um, that are listed here. So for a higher salinity reef, we were able to do all four with the control of 7.8 and then the three um, lower pH treatments of 7.5, 7.2, and 7. But for our low salinity reef, we we're only able to do the control of 7.8 and then a low pH of 7.2 for the sake of comparison. Um, but for a higher salinity reef, we did want to do all four um, because that gives us better resolution in determining at what pH do we really start to see impacts for growth and survival um, in these larvae. Um, so then what we did is we sampled larvae on days two, four, and six, um, and then the, I'm going to show data from three different metrics here looking at survival, um, protein content, which is a metric for biomass accumulation and therefore growth, um, and then antioxidant potential, which is a metric of cellular stress. So for all these figures, everything I show on the left-hand side will be our higher salinity reef, and everything on the right-hand side will be our lower salinity reef. Um, and then for the different pH treatments, um, the darker colors are higher pHs, and then the lighter colors are lower pHs. Um, and right off the bat, you can see some really um, kind of stark differences between these two figures. So if we look at the high salinity um, reef first, we see a really steep drop off in survival in the first 48 hours of life. And this wasn't surprising. This is often reported. Um, in hatcheries and in, in laboratory studies that you see um, a lot of mortality in the first 48 hours. Um, but what was really interesting, if you look at just the control conditions between the two reefs, is our low salinity reef had a very different response. We didn't see such a steep drop off. It was more of a gradual decline. But by day six, there was a lot more survival um, from our low salinity larvae um, under yeah, for our low salinity larvae at day six compared to our higher salinity reef larvae. Um, and then for our pH treatments, we did see in both cases, the lowest pH treatment we tested had the lowest survival. But just at the control level, we're already seeing physiological differences between these reefs. So now moving to protein content, um, if we look at our higher salinity reef, we see pretty rapid growth under control conditions um, to day six. But then looking at our lower salinity reef larvae, they grew much slower, and by day six, they were a smaller size. So again, we're seeing physiological differences just at the control level. Um, but then what was really interesting between the four different pH treatments that we were able to test from our higher salinity reef, we didn't see any significant differences in size between pHs 7.8 and 7.5, but they were significantly larger than larvae at 7.2, which were then significantly larger than larvae at 7. Um, so it seems in um, at pHs in between 7.5 and 7.2, there is a threshold at which the pH gets low enough that it starts impacting how well larvae are able to grow and how quickly they can grow. So now moving to antioxidant potential, this is a general marker for looking at um, cellular stress. So under stressful conditions, cells produce reactive oxygen species. And in or those reactive oxygen species can do a lot of damage to the cell. So in order to combat that, an organism has to produce antioxidants. Um, so this is a measure of um, basically how many more radical oxygen species can an organism neutralize. So a higher antioxidant potential would be seen as um, better in this case, and a lower antioxidant potential would mean they couldn't handle much more cellular stress beyond that point. Um, and generally here, we didn't see any um, differences between our different pH treatments. We did see these general um, decreasing trends for both reefs. That's somewhat expected. It's generally reported that antioxidant potential does decrease um, as an organism ages. Um, but 
the main takeaway from this is since we didn't see any differences between the pH treatments, it doesn't seem that oxidative stress is really playing any role in um, these different physiological differences that we see um, between the two reefs and then also within the pH treatments within each reef. So to summarize, um, we do see clear physiological differences between the reefs, which is really interesting. It gets at that point of it's not so easy to generalize um, results from an assessment in one population to the entire species range. But that said, there really wasn't any clear link between the water quality history that the adult reefs experience and the acidification tolerance of um, the larvae that we assessed. But that said, I do have more metrics left to analyze. One of those is sodium potassium ATPase activity, and that's one of those enzymes that's really driving um, acid base regulation. So that should be really interesting um, to see that data once we have it. Um, and then to conclude, um, like I said, those physiological differences really do illustrate that point that the impacts of climate change may not be as generalizable from one population to another. And that's really important for management because if a population is assessed that is particularly susceptible to climate change and that's used to generalize for the entire species, we're overestimating how severe the impacts um, from climate change may be. And obviously the opposite would also be true. If a very stress tolerant population was assessed and then that was used to generalize across the species range, we would be really seriously underestimating the impacts on that species. And that could be a real problem, um, particularly for these ecologically and economically important species like the Eastern oyster. Um, so, this is just kind of my stump to really highlight the importance of continuing these population level assessments physiologically in marine invertebrates to get a better handle on what sorts of population level differences really exist and what that means with ongoing climate change. Um, as I said, some species could be more vulnerable than we realize and others may be more resilient um, and that may help shape um, directions that the aquaculture industry could go in terms of what species maybe they should focus on. Um, and lastly, if there are physiological differences between these populations and they are heritable, this could be a beneficial tool for aquaculture as you could use specific populations to breed more resilient broodstock to maintain sustainable output as climate change continues in the future. Um, so with that, I'd just like to thank everybody in the Revest Lab and the VIMS Hatchery Systems who helped out with the project. I'd also like to thank my committee members and everybody else who helped me identify oyster reefs and maintain oysters. And then I'd like to thank Sea Grant and NOAA OAP for funding this fellowship opportunity. And I will be happy to take any questions in the Q&A. Thank you. Thanks so much, Anthony. It was wonderful to hear about your research. You've been involved with MECAN for some time and didn't know all that detail. So that's what, that's great. Um, and last but finally, not least, we'd like to welcome Liza Wright Fairbanks to give a, her presentation. Welcome, Liza. Thank you. Thanks, Avalon. Let me just get my presentation up. Are we seeing the slides now? I sure am. Looks great. Okay. Great. Um, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for being here today. I'm Liza Wright Fairbanks. Um, I'm the OA Fellow from New Jersey. I recently got my PhD from Rutgers University, and now I'm a C. Grant Knauss Fellow at um, NOAA's Ocean Acidification Program. Um, it's been really great to hear from all of my fellow fellows today, and I'm excited to tell you about uh, my fellowship project, and I'll be discussing development and applications of pH glider technology in the Mid-Atlantic Bite. The study area for my work is the Mid-Atlantic Bite, which is pictured here outlined in red. It stretches from Cape Hatteras in the south to Cape Cod in the north, um, and it encompasses many city centers like New York and Baltimore and Washington, D.C., um, a lot of uh, human interactions with the coast here. I put a star uh, where Rutgers is, which is where I did this work. So as I said, Mid-Atlantic has a lot of human interactions with the coast and, and some is pretty reliant on marine resources, including commercial and recreational fishery species, um, which are listed here. I've highlighted four 
shellfish species. Um, so we have surf clams, eastern oysters, cohogs, and sea scallops. And these four species account for about 75% of total landings revenue in the mid-Atlantic every year. Um, so these are all bivalves, which is a little unfortunate because they're all expected to be susceptible to ocean acidification um, because they have carbonate shells. Um, so it's important that we understand ocean acidification in the mid-Atlantic and, and how these organisms respond to it so that we can better manage their stock. In the Mid-Atlantic, there are many drivers and modes of acidification, um, so I'll go through those briefly. First, we have atmospheric carbon dioxide, which is kind of our um, general ocean acidification definition, where CO2 is absorbed um, from the atmosphere into the ocean, uh, causing acidification. In the Mid-Atlantic Bite, we also have a lot of freshwater input from um, like the Hudson River and Delaware River. And this freshwater has a lower buffering capacity for carbon dioxide. So when it mixes with the ocean water, um, it creates more acidification in the coastal zone. We have nutrient runoff from land, which um, interacts with the carbonate system in the coast and also spurs biological activity. And biological activity can either dampen or enhance acidification, um, depending on when and where it's happening. In the Mid-Atlantic Bite, we have two major ocean currents that are kind of meeting and mixing. Um, so we have the Gulf Stream that comes up the East Coast from the South, and it carries warm, uh, less acidified water northward. And then we have the Labrador Current coming down the East Coast from the North, uh, which carries cold, more acidified water southward. So when these two meet and mix, um, depending on their relative interactions, we can see changes in the carbonate chemistry of the Mid-Atlantic Bight um, near the coast. Lastly, we have very intense seasonal stratification in the MAB. Um, so in spring and summer, the surface water heats up and it traps this cold bottom water mass on the shelf. It's called the cold pool. And the cold pool has little ventilation to the atmosphere. So carbon dioxide builds up in this water mass and, and causes acidification in that, um, that deep water. So we have all of these different drivers of acidification kind of interacting in the MAB. Um, it's important that we're able to track them and track the effects on the carbonate system in the region. Traditionally, this monitoring has been done through large cruise campaigns um, and with uh, stationary buoys. So for cruises in the MAB, we have the East Coast Ocean Acidification Cruises, uh, NOAA Ecomon Cruises, and Ships of Opportunity all of which cover a high spatial region. Um, they cover a lot of ground or a lot of water, I guess, um, but they're missing this key seasonal uh, resolution that is really applicable to biological processes. Um, in terms of buoys, we have a CO2 buoy in Chesapeake Bay and then one nearby in the Gulf of Maine. And these buoys have really high temporal resolution. They get a ton of information but they do sit in just one area. Um, so they're missing that kind of spatial resolution aspect. Uh, additionally, they're lacking in important fishery zones in um, the coastal region, which where it would be really helpful to have um, this type of information. In order to fill some of those gaps in the traditional monitoring uh, system, we developed a pH glider. This is a collaborative effort between the four groups that are listed here on the right. And this development of this technology is published um, and described in Saba et al. 2019 in Frontiers in Marine Science. Gliders are autonomous underwater vehicles. Um, so we put them out in the ocean and they stay out and they move on their own for weeks to months at a time. They alter their buoyancy in order to move up and down in the water column. So um, they end up gliding from sea surface to the bottom in kind of this zigzag sawtooth shaped pattern. And they're collecting data along this entire uh, track. When they're out on deployments, um, they can communicate with us and we can communicate with them via satellite. So we're, we're able to check in and make sure everything's looking good during these missions. Our glider had a newly developed deep sea pH sensor 
uh, integrated into the pumped CTD port. So we're getting pH, conductivity, temperature, and depth data on all of our emissions. Um, this glider also has an eco puck for biological measurements and an Endera optode for oxygen measurements. So we're able to characterize all of these variables in high resolution um, throughout all of our missions. We sent the pH glider out on four seasonal deployments off the coast of New Jersey. These occurred from spring 2018 through fall 2019. Um, their tracks are pictured here. Three of the deployments left out of Sandy Hook, New Jersey, and one left out of Atlantic City, New Jersey. Um, and so we got this nice um, spatial and temporal look at um, what's happening in the carbonate system on the in the mid-Atlantic coast. Um, I'll give you kind of a brief overview of what kind of data the, the glider deployments can provide for us. To orient everyone to these types of figures, um, on the x-axis we have distance from shore in kilometers. So the left side of the figure will be near shore and the right side of the figure will be at the shelf break. Um, on the y-axis we have depth in meters and then our variable of choice is plotted in color over that um, spatial plane. So the variable I'll be showing you today is aragonite saturation state, which is very important for uh, shellfish. So we'll start with winter. This is our winter profile. In winter, we saw um, a very homogeneous water column, well mixed, um, and the, the saturation state was, I believe, the lowest average that we saw throughout, um, throughout the year. So it was about 1.5 to 2. Our spring deployment captured the beginnings of the formation of the cold pool on the shelf, um, where we start to see this low uh, aragonite saturation state signal. And then we saw that signal fully developed in summer. Um, so the cold pool is the bottom water mass that is dark blue here, and that means it has low saturation state. Um, it's a, it dipped below one in some spots, but hovered usually around 1.2. Um, we saw a higher saturation state in surface water. And then in fall, we see uh, overturned mixing. So we're returning back to that homogeneous winter condition, um, but with a little bit higher saturation state. So those are the general seasonal patterns that we saw. Um, and it's described in more detail in Wright Fairbanks et al. 2020 and JGR Oceans. Um, and I did, for my dissertation, I took a deeper dive into quantifying the drivers of all of these seasonal changes in the carbonate system. Um, I'm not gonna go into detail on that today, but to give you an idea of the drivers of these changes, um, it was freshwater inputs in, in the near shore causing uh, lower saturation states there. Then we had uh, mixing of slope water onto the shelf at the shelf break. Um, causing higher saturation states at the shelf break in every season. And then we had um, biological activity that was kind of more minor, um, changing the system on a, on a smaller scale in places like the chlorophyll maximum where we would see higher saturation states. Um, and that's in preparation for publication now. Um, but today I wanted to pivot a little bit and talk about how we can connect this high resolution data and these seasonal changes to biology in the region. Um, and I'll specifically be talking about the Atlantic sea scallops today. Sea scallops are a very economically important um, fishery in the mid-Atlantic region, bringing in hundreds of millions of dollars every year. The major ports for this fishery are in Massachusetts and New Jersey. And the stock is healthy, um, it's not overfished, but there has been this recorded northward shift of landing ports for sea scallops in the last 20 years. And that's been linked to increasing bottom water temperatures in the region, which shows that the species is responding to environmental change. Sea scallops have two major spawning seasons in the mid-Atlantic, those are in spring and fall. Um, and after spawning, these pelagic larvae are transported hundreds of kilometers along shore over the course of about 35 days. And that's a pretty long larval period. Um, and during that time, they're making their first shells and they're growing and developing um, so that they can eventually settle successfully. 
And um, so as they're traveling, as they're being transported, they're encountering environmental change, including potentially pockets of acidification. If we bring back the glider data, um, so here I have our spring saturation state and fall saturation state profiles, and I've circled where sea scallops live and spawn um, on both of the in both seasons. Um, and depending on season, we saw different carbonate system dynamics. So in spring and fall, the average pH is actually pretty similar. It was about eight in the scallop uh, spawning zones. But saturation state differed. So in spring, the average is about 1.5. In fall, average was about 2.1, 2.2. Um, and so this tells us that scallops that are spawning in these different seasons are creating larvae that will experience different chemical worlds and may have an easier time spawning in fall when um, saturation state is higher and there's more carbonate available in the system for larvae to, to utilize to grow and develop. Um, so to look at this a little bit uh, deeper, we developed a larval dispersal model, and this was based on a model first developed by Daphne Monroe et al. in 2018, um, and we incorporated the acidification aspect into it. Um, so in this model, we released particles, um, which are our larvae, from four scallop management zones in the Mid-Atlantic Bight. Those are Virginia Beach, Delmarva, New York Bight, Long Island, my pictured on the right. We did this simulated release from May through October of every year over the course of seven years. Um, and so we captured kind of the whole uh, available spawning time. We would release particles and then track them as they grew and moved along the coast and eventually settled. And, and we um, we'll look at whether or not they settled successfully, which we defined as any particle reaching a length greater than 250 microns within 45 days of release in water that was less than 100 meters depth um, and inside the designated habitat bounds. And also within our model runs, we were testing the effects of sensitivity to ocean acidification on settlement success and connections between the different spawning regions. So we looked at particles that were sensitive to changes in carbonate chemistry, and we also looked at particles that were not sensitive to changes in carbonate chemistry in terms of their growth. So I'll briefly um, tell you about some of the results from this. So we found that larval scallops that were sensitive to changes in carbonate chemistry or were sensitive to acidification were most successful in fall and in the southernmost Virginia Beach region. And this was linked to high saturation state conditions um, in fall compared to the rest of the seasons and in Vir Virginia Beach compared to the rest of the um, spawning regions. So we were really seeing that impact where when our saturation stays high and there's a lot of carbonate, the, the larvae are happy and they're able to successfully settle more more successfully settle. Um, we also found that sensitivity to OA negatively impact settlement success as well as population connectivity. So this means that uh, larvae that were sensitive to changes in the carbonate system were less successful and had less population connections than those that were not sensitive. And this is important because the sensitivity level of larval sea scallops to OA is currently unknown. Um, we don't know what the response is. It hasn't been determined in the lab yet. And our model simulations show that it could have uh, an effect on the success of the population um, and their spawning abilities. So it's important to figure that out um, as we go so that we can make more, more effective management decisions for the species. Um, so with that, I'll give you a, a couple key takeaways from this work. Um, first, that glider technology enables the high resolution description of carbonate chemistry in the mid-Atlantic on a seasonal uh, level. Next, that seasonal carbonate chemistry can impact the success of these important commercial species over the course of the year. 
And lastly, that the sensitivity of sea scallops to OA will determine the success of the species in, um, in the mid-Atlantic and should be considered um, when making management decisions. And with that, I'll say thank you to the Saba Lab group at Rutgers, as well as the Rutgers Cool Group, um, our glider technicians, and our collaborator collaborators from Rutgers, UDEL, uh, Seabird, Teledyne, and Atlantic Capes Fisheries. And I'd like to thank um, my funding sources, especially the OAP and uh, Sea Grant for this awesome opportunity. Um, and I have, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks. Great, so we have a couple minutes left for um, Q&A. If folks have some questions, please put them in the questions box and I will turn it over to Anthony. He's our resident expert at uh, moderating our <laughs> MAKAN webinar Q&A session. So I'll leave it to him to sort of continue doing that and also he'll respond to some questions as we have them. But thanks. Yeah, happy to. Um, so we do have a few questions here so far. Uh, please feel free to put more in though as we go along. Um, our first question is for Carolyn. Um, in the embryo ionocyte experiments, what conditions were the mothers held at? Would you expect maternal effects to influence ionocyte density? Wait, okay. <laughs> Um, I didn't have embryo ionocyte experiment. Are you getting confused with Teresa? Oh, oh yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah, I think it is. It's I didn't got the wrong name. Missed because we were trying to. We have two laptops in here, um, so I missed you saying that. Yeah. Yeah, I can um, repeat it. So I, the question uh, was, what conditions were the mothers held at, and would you expect maternal effects to influence ionocyte density? And so I answered this in the chat so I can elaborate a little more because I'm not sure if I send that to everybody. Um, so the parents in these experiments, at least the ones that I presented, were all collected from the wild, um, like within a day or two before spawning. Um, so they had basically just been in like the, in, the current environmental conditions of throughout. So the spawning season is April to June, pretty much. So the temperature uh, would have been like, 15 to 20. And as we go later in the season, we see a pH starting to get a little more extreme in those fluctuations um, and, and maybe some more hypoxic periods. So we do, we have been considering this a lot um, with like all of the effects that we've been looking at. Um, and there was a paper by um, Chris Murray from, uh, from his work with Hannes Bauman where they talked a lot about the potential for transgenerational effects. Um, basically, we think that as the season goes on, the parents are experiencing more extreme conditions and potentially preparing their offspring better. And we're seeing better resistance to high CO2 uh, in the experiments that were done later in the season. Uh, and it, could be that they're like experiencing these stressors and somehow like know to give more energy or or somehow prepare the offspring or it could just be as the season goes on they're getting more food um like more zooplankton are around or something and they're getting stronger and are able to allocate more energy into the uh uh like the the egg yolk and for the ionocyte specifically um when i broke this data up into the three different experiments um, from one year, uh, we did see much higher uh, ionocyte densities overall um, in the second experiment, which was in May, as compared to the first one, which was in April. Um, so we might be seeing a little bit of this effect, and I definitely want need to like look into it more. Okay, the next question is for Carolyn, <laughs> uh, and it's, was it expected that this gene silencing wore off, and would you expect the larvae to be able to develop the juveniles if the gene had remained silenced for longer? Yeah, so I actually, in when I ordered the probes from the company, it said that sometimes the effect only lasts seven days if you don't re-expose them. So like that wasn't that concerning that the effect wore off from that. 
And then I don't think that they would have survived to be juveniles because a lot of the ones with really deformed shells, I don't think would have ever settled and metamorphosized. I think if we, if the effect had stayed and we kept monitoring them, they wouldn't have settled and they would have eventually died. That's my hypothesis. Great, thanks. Uh, so the next question is for Faye. Can you put the excursions you measured into context? For example, did the extreme event shift pH outside of the tolerable biological limits, or did the three mechanisms kind of cancel each other out? Okay, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, to be honest, I don't know what the, what's the pH limit for like oysters in the York River, but uh, for during the extreme event, I think both uh, biology and physical processes those decrease pH quite a bit. And outgassing uh, cancels out the impact, uh, but not all of the reductions due to the other two uh, processes. Uh, yeah, so it, yeah, it's, it might be worth looking into like, uh, yeah, cal calculating the residual between all those three and see if we see uh, like big re reductions in pH and compare to, uh, the actual limit, or I can look at like uh, oyster, the aragonite saturation state. There's some study here at VIMS looking at the uh, threshold for saturation state. So maybe I could look at that as well. Thank you. Here, next question is for Liza. Um, from transport and settlement model, the highest success was for the southern quadrant VDM. How does this square with the fact that adult landings are significantly larger in the north? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so, yes, so the lower success in the south that we see is because of warming temperatures. Um, the temperatures in that Virginia Beach region are likely too warm for scallops to, to be successful in any, any major way. Um, so I think in our model, at that, um, when we had those warm temperatures, we were also seeing very high saturation state. Um, and so that's where this OA sensitive versus not OA sensitive thing kind of comes in because the OA sensitive larvae were seeing high success, even though it was so warm because it was also such high saturation state. Um, but the non OA sensitive larvae we're not seeing that same success. Um, so I think there is kind of some interplay between those variables and, and that's something to consider when we're thinking about in what ways scallop larvae are sensitive to, um, to carbonate chemistry. Um, so there could be this compensating mechanism, but we're not sure because we don't actually know like lab based how these, how the larvae are responding. Um, so that's a really good question. and. Yeah, I'm interested to know more once once that work is um, done a little bit more. Well, I think that that just about does it for our time today. Um, thank you all again for your time, for your research, for coming on and talking about it. Um, and again, please do feel free to email info at midacan.org or even me. Uh, at abristo at midatlanticocean.org if you have additional questions for our panelists today. Um, we're happy to try and facilitate answers after the fact, even though we are out of time for this afternoon. Um, okay, thank you. We'll wrap it up there. <laughs>